A commenter recommended that I attempt a Madden 2004 rebuild with the Oakland Raiders. I haven't played Madden 2004 in 20 years, so why not? Let's rebuild the Raiders. Obviously, this team is coming off the Super Bowl loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers the year before. The plan here isn't to blow the team up the first year. I'll explain why as I go through the roster, but let's look at their best players. Rich Gannon is the best player on the team, came to Oakland at the age of 30. 34 and just redefined his career. Four Pro Bowls, two All-Pros, one MVP during their Super Bowl run last year. Hard to believe this man was drafted by New England in 1987 and they wanted to convert him into a receiver, a running back, or a defensive back. Now he was then traded to Minnesota, spent six seasons there, went off to Washington where he played only three games, then to Kansas City for another four seasons before finally landing ending in Oakland where I'm assuming he's going to retire at the end of this season. Lincoln Kennedy is the best starting offensive lineman on this team. He's been with Oakland since 1996 and while he's only 32, which is not entirely old for an offensive lineman, at least in Madden, he retired after this season in real life. I don't think that will happen in this simulation, but you can already see a trend on this team. Rod Woodson was in the same draft as Rich Gannon. This team is old. I've been playing 2K5 so much, for some reason I just believed Woodson was on the Raiders for most of his career. He was with the team for two years, won a ring with the Ravens, spent a season with the 49ers, but started and played most of his career in Pittsburgh. I also assumed he was always a free safety. He was a cornerback before turning into a free safety with Baltimore. His replacement after he left was Ed Reed, so Hall of Famer replaced placing Hall of Famer. What are the odds? We have our first player under the age of 30 who's on the elite list, Charles Woodson. We all know who Charles Woodson is since he's the player that sacked Tom Brady to force a fumble and was recovered by Oakland. Yes, the Patriots lost that game. Brady was benched the following season and Bledsoe continued to take over for the Patriots for years to come. Yep. Shane Leckler is up next. He's only been in the league for three seasons and he's already 27. That's kind of old for a player to enter the league at 24. Either way, he's a punter. He could probably play until he's, you know, the age of 41. We're at the bottom of the elite list here and Charlie Garner instant offense is up next and I didn't realize how impressive he was as a pass catcher during the Super Bowl run. It's also interesting to see that most of these players are on the back end of their career and haven't been with Oakland for that long. It really reminds me of the Over the Hill Gang from the early 70s Washington's team. Gardner deserves a lot more respect for how much he left out there on the field. You knew he was on this team. Jerry Rice at the ripe age of 40. There's not really much I can say about him other than fun fact, even though he retired in 2005, he's still in Madden 2006 on the Denver Broncos. I believe at the end of the year, there's going to be a lot of retirements. The final elite player on the team is Sebastian Janikowski or Seabass. The hefty lefty was the last kicker to ever be taken in the first round. I don't think that's ever going to happen again, but I do think it worked out really well for the Raiders considering that 2000 draft. Yeah, a lot of these starters will be retiring at the end of the season. I do find it interesting that the next oldest player is 33, which is still old, but not please retire old. Rich Gannon is clearly our starting quarterback, but I had no clue Rick Meyer was still in the NFL NFL at this point. He even started a few years this season IRL with Marcus Tuiasa Sopo being the backup. In theory, the idea would be to let Gannon ride off into the sunset like Elway with one last Super Bowl run, then hand over the reins to Marcus Tuiasa Sopo. Now the running back position gets interesting. I don't know when these players retire. Our two best players at the position, Garner and Wheatley, are both 31. There can't be that many years left in them plus regression could hit hard. I do 
do think Gardner has a few good years left in him, so we don't have to worry about that yet. At fullback, we have two mediocre players, but Crockett is a fast boy at that position. I really don't know how important the fullback position is in this game, so we'll see if it works out at the end of the season. Our starting two wide receivers are the age of 37 and 40, the pinnacle of youth. In all seriousness, it makes sense that the offense strived using players that were really good at running their routes. It was a West Coast offense, speed isn't as important as precision. I'm pretty sure both Rice and Brown will retire after this season, which makes Jerry Porter that much more important. The offseason will make this position interesting. Do I draft a playmaker or sign one? Another position that isn't particularly great, the tight ends. I don't know how much of an impact they'll have on the offense, but they're not great. And we're about to find out if it's going to impact this season. This offense feels really legit, mostly because of the offensive line. Barry Sims is a blindside blocker and he isn't quite elite, but he's getting there. He also has a few more prime years left in him. Frank Middleton is our starting left guard. His backup is Stitchcomb. If injuries happen, we have decent players ready to step up and they're all in their prime. Barrett Robbins may be on the back end of his prime, but he's still very much serviceable. We have good depth behind him as well. Keep in mind, I don't want the backups to be the starters. I don't mind them playing a game or two, but I wouldn't trust them to start the entire season. That's what I mean by good depth. This would be bad depth. If Collins goes down, we're in trouble. But since we had good enough players in Stitchcone, Trio, and Walker, I might just play them out of position if an injury happens, but when everyone is healthy, this team is good. Now this would be terrible depth. We already went over Kennedy, he's elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slaughter. Well, Gannon is going to be slaughtered if he has to play, and thankfully, like I said, we have enough players out of position that we can put if that happens. The defensive line doesn't get the same luxury as the offensive line. At left end, Trace Armstrong is the starter, though I would consider letting number 98 take over since he is a rookie and he could help his development. Plus, Armstrong is 37. There aren't many miles left on him. At right end, we have Tony Bryant penciled in as the starter, and as you you can see our pass rushers and edge defenders aren't the best depending on how the season goes and the development of the players I wouldn't be opposed to drafting an edge player in the first round. We do have three good defensive tackles in Mozzarella Perella, Coleman, and Stubblefield. Two of them over the age of 30 but it did make me wonder if I can convert one of them into a defensive end. When I tried to do that with Coleman I couldn't so we're kind of stuck with all these guys at the defensive tackle but I can play a at a position in the depth chart. At left outside linebacker, we have Bill Romanowski, another 37-year-old starter who's most likely going to retire at the end of the season. Another position where I don't know if I'm going to draft or sign a replacement in the offseason. Now, shockingly, we do have some good young players. We have Napoleon Harris at middle linebacker, which means we don't have to worry about this position. We also have Eric Barden at right outside linebacker, another young player that's pretty good. No one at the corner position is over 30, but one is pretty close. Woodson and Buchanan will be the starting cornerbacks on the team, with Shaw being the nickel and number 29, who I think think is Namdi Asamoa as the dime. At free safety is Rod Woodson, another position that we'll have to look into replacing this offseason because we don't have a good starter behind them. While Derek Gibson is the strong safety, he's not great, but he's young. Here's hoping spending that time, at least a season with Woodson, can help him develop into a decent player going into the next year. While Seabass is the kicker, Leckler the punter. With this team trying to go to the Super Bowl, one more time, I figured we could trade away our draft picks or certain players for impact players. The first trade I thought of was Middleton at left guard. He is in the final year of his contract and he's going to be as expensive as Stinchcomb. So I went to the trade block looking for available players and Willie McGinnis caught my eye. He's over 30 so that's perfect for this team. Plus he can still go at defensive end. I tried trading draft picks for <laughs> Willie McGinnis going as high as a second rounder but New England was adamant about having a first round pick for him. I decided that's a little too rich for my blood. I abandoned this idea. The next offer I looked into was Arturo Freeman from Miami. He's not leaps and bounds better than Gibson, but he is 
better. They wanted a guard and I offered Stinchcomb for Freeman. Nay, didn't want none of that. Only willing to accept the trade if it was Middleton. I abandoned this idea, so I went back to New England with a new offer for McGinnis. My original plan was to move one of my defensive tackles to defensive end and trade for McGinnis in order to have a solid front four. I caved and decided to give them Stubblefield since they were looking for a defensive tackle. New England was not interested. They wanted Mozzarella Perella or Coleman, but not Stubblefield, at least not without some draft capital, which the lowest they accept would have been a second round pick. I abandoned this idea as well. I decided to keep my defensive tackles, making Perella and Stubblefield my two starting defensive tackles while moving Coleman to the right defensive end spot over Tony Bryant. Let's not wait any further. The preseason has been simulated and I don't plan on blowing the team up. If we struggle early, I might end up making some desperate trades to make a Super Bowl run. This team is the definition of Super Bowl or bust. Luckily, we didn't get any major injuries in the preseason and the one injury we did have was to our fourth string running back, which now means the season is underway week one versus the Tennessee Titans. They blew them away in the first half and that's all she wrote. Rich Gannon showing that he still got it, Tim Brown showing he's still a playmaker, and Charles Woodson with an interception and a forced fumble, the team is firing on all cylinders. Week 2 will be a home opener against the Cincinnati Bengals. They hung a 40-burger on the Bengals, Gannon with another 300-yard performance, Jerry Porter this time going off, Coleman defensive tackle turned defensive end with a sack and a forced fumble. This team looks unstoppable right now. I mean, we've We've only seen two games, but now they have their first divisional matchup here in week three against the Denver Broncos. This one had to go to an extra quarter to get it done, but the Raiders survived to stay undefeated. I did notice Marcus Tuiasa Sopo had to play a few snaps, which made me think Gannon was injured. But thankfully he wasn't. Also Seabass with four kicks. Come on. Yeah, he won the game for us. There was an injury. It wasn't Gannon, but it could be very impactful. Philip Buchanan will be out for five weeks. We don't really have great depth behind him. And with the trade deadline at week six, we'll see how this defense does the next two weeks before exploring some options. The first quarter of the season will wrap up with another division matchup, this time against the Chargers. Raiders went up 27-3 in the fourth quarter and almost let it slip through their fingers. I find it surprising considering that Drew Brees threw three interceptions. Looks like Philip Buchanan's injury wasn't affecting the defense and Charlie Gardner went over 100 yards for the first time this season, but those two fumbles are troubling. This could be the reason why the Raiders collapsed in the fourth. Kennedy and and Sims, both starting tackles, ended up getting injured in this game. That's not good. Slaughter even got injured. I'm okay with Walker taking over for a few games until Sims can come back, but Slaughter is also injured, and even if he wasn't, I was not going to have him start. Instead, I'm going to play Stinchcomb out of position until we get a healthy Kennedy. We won two division games. We're at 4-0. We can afford to lose a game or two. I'm just happy they're not out for longer. Before we go to week five, this offense has been dominant. Surprisingly, only second in points scored, but we're first in passing and middle of the pack in rushing. I am worried about sacks with this offensive line while defensively we're struggling. Giving up a lot of yards, we're not giving up a lot of points. Third in points allowed, let's just hope the injury bug doesn't continue or else this could change very quickly. Week 5 and they take on the Bears. I'm beginning to worry. You know what's great? We only allowed three points. You know what's not great? We only scored 10. Once again, Marcus Tuiasa Sopo had to come in and play. Gannon wasn't injured, or at least injured for more than this game. If Gannon goes down, I do not feel confident. After seeing how bad our pass defense was, I went back to the trade block to Miami for Jamar Fletcher. If you're a Dolphins fan, you know that this was the guy Miami drafted over Drew Brees in 2001. I wanted him to fill in for Philip Buchanan while he's out with an injury. Unfortunately, these draft picks have little to no value in this game. This player is not worth a second round pick, so I changed my plans. I went back to Willie McGinnis, and this time they were willing to accept a second round pick, unlike before the season started. I really wanted to pull the trigger on this, but I 
didn't want to give up a second rounder, so I passed. I ended up looking for the worst team in the NFL, hoping for a fire sell from one of them, so I went to Arizona and wanted their cornerback Starks. He's 29, they're not going to make the playoffs, I figured they could part with them. They wanted a first, a second, and a third for him. That's a no from me, dog. I did end up finding a veteran on a team that was willing to trade, Troy Vincent and it would only cost a first rounder. Troy Vincent is going into the twilight of his career. He'd fit here perfectly, but I noticed the Eagles are three and one. There's no way a team with that record trades away one of their best defensive players. And then I went back to New England looking at 37 year old Smith. I was hoping he'd be cheap, you know, maybe a fourth, a third. Nope, they wanted a second rounder for him. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, we ain't doing that. Lastly, I went back to Miami to look into Terrell Buckley, and he's a decent corner. They wanted a third for him, and at this point, I just, I just abandoned trading altogether. Let's go to week six. Going into our sixth game of the season, and we've only had two home games. That's a tough schedule. This week, gonna be against the Browns. Once again, hitting that 31-point threshold for this offense is the goal. Considering that the last game we scored 10, Gannon was close to 300 yards, but Tim Couch showing off his passing skills. Charlie Gardner looked like he got an injured during the game, but he was available for the next week while Jerry Rice continues to show that there is life after 40. We're now at the final game before the bye week. It's a divisional game against the Kansas City Chiefs. I do think these injuries have slowed down this Oakland offense but not enough to stop them from continuing their undefeated season so far. I do think the biggest reason we're so dominant is because of Rich Gannon. I am scared to see how season two goes when he retires. Same goes for Jerry Rice and Tim Brown. This offense is going to be so flaccid. We're now at the bye week and what's interesting is we haven't faced anyone with a winning record in the first half of the season. Well, a winning record, you know, after they finished losing to us. The final six games of the year will be interesting since we did go to overtime against the Broncos. The Steelers, Ravens, and Packers all have winning records and we almost threw away a game against San Diego. Our team should be relatively healthy for this matchup against the Detroit Lions. 51 points on the Lions. Six touchdown performance by Gannon. Have I mentioned how much I think this man is carrying this team? Charlie Gardner with over 100 on the ground and what I find incredible is even though they threw for over 300, not a single receiver had 100 yards. Remember when I said we were relatively healthy? I mean, for the most part we are, but everyone is going to be playing through injuries besides Robin. Luckily, we have a backup, but who knows how this affects the team. As long as Gannon is healthy, I remain confident. Kennedy will push through his pain to start this coming week, and Philip Buchanan will be doing the same. Halfway through the season, I just wanted to quickly show how much this defense has improved. They're shutting things down. They're going to need that against the Jets this week, possibly their toughest game so far based on record. This defense doesn't need to be perfect with the way this offense is playing right now. Gannon once again taking control of the game. Even with Gardner getting injured again, they managed to put up close to 40 points. It helps when Jerry Rice is playing like he's 20 again. They should have a cakewalk this week against the Minnesota Vikings. It wasn't 51 points, but 31 was more than good enough. That is the third game that Marcus Tuiasa Sopo had to come in for Gannon. Injuries add up and let's hope that doesn't happen to Gannon. Another game where Gardner and Wheatley were splitting carries while Jerry Rice continues to be forever 21. Now I understand why they were splitting carries. He's still better than anyone else that we have. It isn't even that much of a drop in rating. We're now in the final six games, 10-0. This is the true test. First being a division rematch against the Kansas City Chiefs. The defense won this one for Oakland. The offense wasn't spectacular, but did more than enough to win. Gardner continues to play well through injuries. Jerry Rice continues to show his youth. The biggest rematch of the season? It took an extra quarter to beat the Broncos. Does the undefeated season end here? Not even close. The Broncos didn't even score a touchdown. Rich Gannon returns to form after having a bit of a slump the past few weeks. While this time, Tim Brown decided to show his youth. They may be old, 
but they're still very good. Four more games to go undefeated and the next three teams have a winning record first up, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Wasn't even close. I'm beginning to believe we might go undefeated gang. Rich Gannon ganning it up. Next team on the list, the Baltimore Ravens. This one was closer, down at halftime, but the defense shuts them out. Rich Gannon was in a funk. Not a great day, but Charlie Garner was garnering it up. Two games away, and this is the one I think could end the undefeated season. Week 16 against the Packers. At one point, it was tied at 17 before Gannon got out of his funk again. Gannon has kind of been a little bit inconsistent in the second half of the season. Thankfully, we have playmakers like Rice, Brown, and Gardner to help him out when he's struggling. And now the final game of the year to go undefeated. Oakland almost lost to the Chargers earlier this year. Can they stop history from happening? It was tied in the fourth quarter at 20. Then Oakland said, no more messing around. Let's make history. Rich Gannon with another mid performance. Funny how a good game like this this one is mid, but Gardner and Wheatley have been splitting more carries lately, so that kind of worries me. 16-0, I don't think I've ever seen an undefeated team in Madden, at least straight out of the box. I didn't really do anything to improve the team, and also that that's a lot of 11-5 teams. That's what happens when you're first in points for and against. This team just built differently. Rich Gannon had a heck of a season. Keep in mind that 4,000 yard seasons weren't as common as they are today, so I mean they still happen. It felt rarer back then. Also, I'm not sure if I want to hand over the reins to Marcus to Weasa Sopo next season. I do think it's really neat that their stats are very similar to the previous season. Ganondorf is going to finish his career on a high note, that's for sure. We didn't score a lot of rushing touchdowns, but we didn't need to. But one thing I don't like seeing is how Wheatley is a huge drop off in performance compared to Gardner. We're going to have to look into someone this offseason to replace him. Charlie Gardner had his best season so far at the age of 31. Most running backs don't continue to produce at this level and it's gonna be interesting to see how regression hits him. I think it's so impressive to throw for over 4,000 yards and have only one receiver over a thousand. Brown almost hit that number but it just means that this team is spreading it out to everyone. This is also what I'm talking about stats. It seems to be on par with the previous seasons. Like, what the heck, Rice? You shouldn't be putting up these numbers this late in your career. Nobody on the offensive line allowed 10 sacks or more, and if you think these are bad, trust me. Someone on another team allowed 20. No double-digit sacks on defense either. Coleman, our defensive tackle, I moved to defensive end this season, led with eight, along with Mozzarella Perella and Eric Barden. Bill Romanowski is still putting up really good numbers even in his final season. Charles Woodson led in interceptions along with Eric Barton. You know, I'm starting to think Barton is, uh, he's gonna be a pretty good player. Woodson having his best season stat-wise in a while. I think the defense has some really solid players to build around. It's the offense I'm worried about. Looks like spending a first on Seabass was worth it. Look at that season performance. It's his best season since he's been in the league. Leckler also didn't have to use his leg that much this season. I wanted to show how dominant this team is. They were first on offense in almost every category except rushing. While on defense, they were second overall, top five in pass and rush defense. This team is elite. If it wasn't obvious Rich Gannon won the MVP and the Offensive Player of the Year, it wasn't even close. Eric Barden won AFC Defensive Player of the Year and AFC Best Linebacker. Charlie Gardner won NFL Best Running Back, which I'm not sure he should have won it. Same with Jerry Rice, he won NFL Best Receiver. Like, don't get me wrong, they both had really good seasons. The thing is, there are so many better running backs than Gardner this season. Same thing for receivers. Too many good performers, and I find it shocking that they won those awards. Kennedy, even though he missed a few games, won best offensive lineman. Mozzarella Perella got fifth for best defensive lineman. And Seabass won best kicker. He was a clear cut winner. Obviously, Callahan won best coach. When you go undefeated, you automatically kind of get that award before we head into the postseason. Only one other player had over 4,000 yards passing. Gannon was just on a completely 
other level. The sacks also seem to be a harder stat to get in this game, but still a high respectable number at 16. I kind of like these lower numbers. Interceptions though, they're kind of high. Also wanted to show how important Janikowski was to this team. He was the only player over 90% kicking. Now on to the playoffs, we have a bye week and with the wild card simulated, our divisional round matchup will be against the Baltimore Ravens. They'll have a second opportunity to end our undefeated season. Here was the divisional round matchup between the undefeated Oakland Raiders and the Baltimore Ravens. Remember, these teams faced off against each other earlier this year. Can the Ravens do what they couldn't in the regular season? End the streak. It shouldn't be too hard today. It's raining and it's cold. The Raiders best players are 37 and 40 years old. I don't think this kind of weather will be nice for them. We start early in the game. A third down for Oakland. Gannon drops back and finds Jolly over the middle to keep the drive going. On the very next play, a drop back. Pressure is coming and he finds Porter to the right to get past the 40. A few plays later, they're now inside the 30. Gannon drops back, moves to his right and finds Rice to get them inside the five. They weren't able to punch it in on first down, but on second and goal, they hand it off to Gardner for the first score in the game. We now go to Baltimore's first drive in this one. They hand it off to Jamal Lewis, and he doesn't get touched at all as he breaks into the open field, past the 40, past the 30, and Charles Woodson makes the touchdown saving tackle. The drive did end up stalling out, forcing them to kick a field goal. If it wasn't for that tackle by Woodson, it'd be tied 7-7. Instead, Oakland still leads. 7 to 3. We skip to the final two minutes of this half. Oakland managed to add three more points. They're backed up in their own end zone. This looks like trouble. The first run didn't get anything, but their second run gets a little bit more, but there's a fumble recovered by Baltimore. It would have been great field position for the Ravens, but it's under two minutes and the play was reviewed and overturned. The Raiders ended up punting the ball back to Baltimore. This should give them great field position regardless. Leckler has a strong leg, but not a strong enough one to push them that far back. On the return, McAllister brings it past the 40 and inside the 30. It would only lead to a field goal from Baltimore. Stover already made one earlier, but this time it's no good. The Raiders start the second half with the ball, play action, and Rich Gannon calls his own number. You don't expect your 37-year-old quarterback to be Michael Vick. Third and one, same drive. Gannon drops back, throws, and finds Tim Brown to extend the drive. Another third down on the drive. Gannon drops back and decides, I'm Michael Vick. Burn my dust and eat my rubber. They have Charlie Garner as their running back, but why run with back when quarter do trick? Another first down on the scramble. This Oakland offense is sucking the life out of the Ravens. Another pass, this time to Jolly, who fights his way near the red zone. They're now inside the red zone on this play. Gannon to Porter on the out to get near the first. At the 10 yard line, pressure's coming and throws Rice with a catch and fights his way down to the three. Just like last time, unable to punch it in on the first down, but Gardner takes it on the second down for their second score of the game. The Raiders had a 14 point drive. The will of the Ravens was just broken. Now Oakland will be kicking it off and if you know this channel by now I only show returns for fumbles or touchdowns. Which one is this one? It could be a fumble. It might be a fumble. It could still be a fumble. Apparently it was a fumble, but it was challenged and overturned. The Ravens need a score to stay in this game third down, and they convert it here with this pass. It's now the start of the fourth, fourth down to keep the game alive. He drops back, pressure in his face, and the receiver drops the pass. Turnover on downs. The Ravens do get the ball back later in the fourth. On this play, they find a receiver over the middle to get him across midfield. Immediately following the play, they go back to the air and back to the left side to get close to the first. It's now second and inches. It's going to be another pass and another completion to continue moving this drive down the field. Where the heck was this Ravens offense in the first three quarters? Another reception. 
interception over the middle and gets them inside the red zone. This team is moving, they have the momentum and he finds Robinson open who dives in to make it a one score game again. Now Oakland has a chance to put the game away here with a first down. It's a play action, Gannon called his own number and Ray Lewis was having none of it. That means Oakland will have to punt the ball to Baltimore. They'll have one last chance to tie this game. Remember, earlier in this game, the Ravens got a good return to get him into field goal range. McAllister already into field goal range. One guy to beat, but is brought down six yards short of the end zone. The game comes down to the next four plays, and the first one is a sack. They hurried back to the line. They had more than enough time, and because of the rush, this pass goes straight into the dirt. It's third down. They're going back to the pass over the middle, and it's dropped. Clayton had his hands on it, and it would have been a touchdown. Instead, it's fourth down to keep the season alive fourth down in the shotgun over the middle and Lewis drops it this time back to back drops by the Ravens to drop this game that means the Raiders will walk away from this game still undefeated thanks to the wet weather or the bad hands by the Ravens offense they're now the second team ever to go 17-0 as of this timeline and next week in the AFC championship game they take on the only other 17-0 team in history the Miami Dolphins Two games left for the Oakland Raiders before they enter the history books, and coincidentally, they go up against the only team to go undefeated. The Miami Dolphins have a chance to continue to be the only team to do that feat with a win over Oakland that would send them back to the Super Bowl for the first time since 1984. We'll start this game late in the first quarter. Oakland has a 3-0 lead, but Miami is punting it, and you know what that means. Philip Buchanan is going to find a huge lane and nobody's going to catch him putting the Raiders up 10 nothing going to the middle of the second quarter a big third down they need to convert and fielder finds Thompson who runs over Buchanan for the first down you also have to remember this team has prime Ricky Williams takes this right side and powers through for 10 yards the Dolphins are just outside the 30, marching down the field. Fielder drops back, plenty of time to throw all day in the pocket and finds Chris Chambers over the middle for a first. They weren't able to get it in on the first two downs, but on third down, Travis Miner, I hardly know her, stiff arms his way in to make it a 10-7 game. With less than two minutes left in the half, Oakland would go three and out on their next possession and punting back to the Dolphins. Leckler shanks this one giving Miami great field position. Dolphins will be starting this drive at the 35 on second down. Fielder finds Chambers over the middle to get them inside the 30. They will rush to the line and just over a minute left in the half. It's going to be third down. What will Miami do? Fielder drops back, throws deep. Chambers with a catch, breaks the tackle for a touchdown and the Dolphins are now on top before halftime 10 to 14. We're now in the third quarter. Miami is punting the ball back to Oakland. The Raiders have already returned a punt back for a touchdown. This time Buchanan has a sideline all to himself. Nobody has the angle and just like that the Raiders are back up 17-14. We now fast forward to the start of the fourth quarter. Miami has the ball and need to score to regain the lead. Fielder over the middle and it's picked off by Charles Woodson. Fielder is the only player that can bring him down but can't. Touchdown Oakland. They're now up 24-14. The Dolphins need to get a quick score just under four minutes in the game near midfield. Oakland gets pressure and it's picked off again. The Dolphins' chances are slipping away. Their defense now needs to step up and on the first play, Jason Taylor gets there for the sack. Now near midfield after the sack on second down, Gannon throws towards Rice and Sam Madison picks the pass off. Tim Brown can't make the tackle. Nobody has the angle to cut him off and just like that the Dolphins cut the lead back to 3 24-21 Oakland last week the Raiders needed a first down to end the game against the Ravens but failed this week the same thing 
Earlier in this game, Leckler shanked a punt, and it's always scary sending out the special teams unit in this game. But this time, it's a booming punt, and Miami will return this one, but only near their own 30. They have a long field to work with. On the second play of that drive, Fielder drops back over the middle, and it's almost picked off by Buchanan. Buchanan already had two touchdowns in this game. The other Raider touchdown from Charles Woodson, and Woodson says, nah, that can't be happening, and I need another, and takes this one back to the house to make it a 31-21 game and that will effectively end any chance of Miami's comeback and Oakland now moves on to be 18-0, the only team in history as of this timeline, to do so where they will take on the New York Giants in the Super Bowl. Now we're here in the Super Bowl to see if the Oakland Raiders can continue their road to perfection. Funny enough, it comes against a team that stopped perfection in real life, the New York Giants. I can't think of a better way to end this season than in a Super Bowl matchup against them. Last week against the Dolphins, this Oakland offense had no offensive touchdowns. I'm not even sure they had any offensive highlights, but they get a big play here to Jolly to get across midfield. We also haven't seen much from Charlie Gardner other than those touchdowns near the goal line, but he takes the carry, breaks the tackle, and gets the first down. They're nearing the red zone, Gannon drops back, throws to Jolly on the out, breaks the tackle, and gets another first down. They're now just outside the 10 yard line, Gannon drops back and finds Tim Brown in the end zone, feet in bounds for the first touchdown in the Super Bowl. Giants wouldn't be able to answer back on their first possession, punting it back to the Raiders, and last week Buchanan had two returns for a touchdown. Speed in these older Madden games were so much more important. If you were fast, you were gone. Ain't nobody gonna catch him. Raiders up 14-0. The Giants did answer back with a field goal late in the first. Raiders ball. Gannon calls his own number, has space, and he just drops the ball when a Giant defender got near him. New York recovers it. Here's their chance to cut the lead down. Collins passes it to the flat, River has it, spin move, and first down. Following play, Collins play actions it, throws over the middle to Toomer to get them in the red zone. We're now in the second quarter, third down, Collins throws, and it's almost picked off by Buchanan. The Giants had to settle for a field goal to make it a one possession game, Oakland still up 14-6. Now Oakland has a chance to really extend this lead as Gannon finds Garner down the middle and he gets his way down midfield. Third down same drive to extend it over the middle and this time Porter makes the catch. Oakland is marching down the field and Gannon is being surgical finding Brown over the middle this time. The following play Gannon drops back has time and finds Brown again for the completion. It's now third down Gannon with pressure off his back foot. Brown breaks the tackle breaks the second and it takes a third giant to bring him down in the end zone. Raiders are now leading 21 to 6. The Giants desperately need a score here to keep the game close going into the half. Buchanan intercepts it. Barber's creeping up on him, but he doesn't even try to make the tackle. The Giants needed a score for themselves. I should have I should have clarified that. This game is getting out of hand. We're in the final minute of the half. Raiders have it and have no plans to let up. Gannon to Brown deep on this one. With only 30 seconds left in the half, Gannon drops back. Pressure throws over the middle to the end zone and dropped. Uh, it could have been 35 to six but instead it'll be 31 six going into the half i'm sure giants fans are having ptsd midway through the third quarter raiders had kicked a field goal to take a 34 six lead they're kicking it back to the giants it's going to be returned he runs past a gaggle of raiders he has a seam nobody's going to catch him past the 30 past the 20 past the 10 and it's a touchdown it's now 34 13 raiders the second half where the raiders feels a bit different vitalizing the Giants team near the end of the third quarter third down Collins to Shockey over the middle for the first down this will probably be the final play of the third quarter Collins finds Hillard to get past midfield we're now in the final quarter Giants still down by three touchdowns Collins to Toomer spin move outruns a tackle and down inside the five the Giants team feels completely different than they did before pitch to Barber outside nobody gonna get them. They cut the lead to two scores now. Raiders 34, Giants 20. Let's skip to the final two minutes. Giants ball down by two touchdown. The comeback ends right 
there as Bill Romanowski intercepts this pass and takes it all the way down to the one. His knee was down before he got into the end zone. They challenged it and blah blah blah. He doesn't finish his career with a touchdown. That does mean that Charlie Gardner gets his touchdown here on this handoff and this game is pretty much over. Raiders want their redemption after last year's Super Bowl defeat. The Giants at this point are playing for pride and sadly they don't have any of that left as Buchanan intercepts this pass and takes this one to the end zone. That's a uh, very familiar score for the Raiders fans. Well the Giants don't want to be embarrassed even though they already have been and Hillard takes this one and squeezes through to get to midfield. Giants want to get one more score before the end of the game. Collins will have plenty of time and finds Toomer for the completion. At the 32, Collins with a quick throw to Toomer breaks the tackle, now inside the red zone. There's only 30 seconds left to score and Shockey will get the final touchdown in the Super Bowl and the Raiders will finish the season 19-0, the only undefeated team in the 16 game era. There's no special celebration. I guess now we can move on to season 2. Lots of great players will be retiring and uh, I just know that's not gonna be a very fun season too. Let's see how that goes.